They gather in makeshift tents pitched in dank underpasses and along cluttered alleyways. The luckier ones rent cramped rooms in shabby apartment buildings. They come from China's fertile east and desert west, its frigid north and temperate south, from bustling cities and from lush backcountry. They arrive in the capital Beijing bound by shared hope. They want redress for abuses they say they've suffered at the hands of local authorities. They're China's petitioners, an army of agitators and activists equipped only with their documents and the determination to see justice done. And they all seek the same thing, an honest official who can right the wrongs they believe were committed against them. A Beijing resident who asked to be identified as Feng Dengfu spent a year and a half investigating the lives of China's petitioners. He provided this video to Radio Free Asia's Mandarin service. Well, I can't uh, tell too much details about him, but all I can say is his family name is Feng, and uh, he is one of the brave young citizen journalists who uh, risk their safety to break the stories, sensitive stories that uh, Chinese official media wouldn't cover due to censorship or self-censorship. Most of the time, security guard, cops always follow him and try to take away their camera or delete the memory card. He told me that once he was filming uh, near the Hongsi village, the policeman from Heilongjiang province dragged him away and put him in a police van, a police car, and, and drove to uh, a remote area in uh, Tung County and beat him up badly. But he was an uh, experienced uh, citizen journalist, so he, before the policeman took away his camera, he took out the SC card and put it in the zoo, so we got the footage uh, from him. Many petitioners end up in Hongsi village, a dusty enclave of narrow alleys and dilapidated buildings located in the suburbs of Beijing. Two years ago, the Supreme Court Office for Petitioners relocated to this remote area. The authorities apparently hope to move the petitioner problem out of central Beijing and away from the international media. I proclaim to the world that President Hu Jintao is the only true communist. He knows that the officials under him are corrupt and suppress the people. We came to Beijing to petition. The people of Beijing should support us. What do the Chinese people lack? Since China's reforms began, how many tall buildings have been built? How much have people's lives improved? It's the corrupt officials who benefit. They get rich and eat and drink what ordinary citizens earn. They don't do anything for the Communist Party. Dr. Wei Ran of the University of South Carolina has studied petitioning in China. He says the phenomenon reflects China's Confucian past. In a larger sense, there's a Chinese culture of we have a faith in uh, Mr. Clean in the governmental system that uh, Mr. Clean will be able to hear the grievances of the mass. Because in the Chinese culture, in a larger sense, influenced by Confucius culture, which means they paid a great deal attention or importance to families, uh, to hierarchy, to power, uh, the importance of all those in individuals' lives at the expense of individuals' uh, civil rights, individuals' freedom. So in Chinese culture, in such a hierarchical society, people who suffer from grievances or were victims of corrupt officials, they have nothing but the faith in people up in the hierarchy, the officials, who would be able to symbolize social justice. In a way, they will have the power to really clean the corruptions, uh, get the things in order. Chinese people are people are very, very, very uh, strong with their survival skills. And one of the ways to survive for so many years is to have a hope. That hope is based on a centuries-old petitioning tradition in China. In imperial times, China's emperors used the petition system as a way to maintain contact with their subjects and keep tabs on what was happening in the provinces. 
the, the petitioning system, these letters and visits bureaus in China are sort of deeply historically rooted. When you think about it, it sort of makes sense. I mean, uh, centuries ago, there have always been mechanisms by which the emperor, who's sort of, you know, top of the system, all power fused in the body of the emperor, has had opportunities to kind of intervene in the uh, resolution of individual grievances. So if you are a disgruntled citizen and you are able to sort of make it to Beijing, throw yourself down in front of the, uh, uh, in front of the uh, emperor, intercept his, uh, his, uh, his sedan chair, uh, you may think that you've got the ability to prompt his ability to intervene in, in your problem. And so there have been institutions throughout the imperial period that have allowed individual citizens to sort of try to go to Beijing to reach the emperor or his close officials to call their attention to misdeeds of local authorities. In my hometown, for example, Kaifeng, which was very famous as a capital for several dynasties. And in one of the dynasties, there was a very, very famous magistrate court uh, judge, and he was also the chief executive uh, for the capital. He's like the mayor. In today's term, his name was Bao Qingtian. Under his term, at least the fiction goes, he would like to see justice done to any corruption, any wrongdoers, no matter who they were, even they were royal families. So he was ultimately regarded as a symbol of justice. So in the city of Kaifeng today, it's no longer a capital of anything, but there's a capital uh, as a place for Bao Zheng. Mr. Clean. There's a temple, memorial temple, built in his honor, and thousands of people come to pay tribute to him every day. So he's really a part of the Chinese culture in which whenever there's social injustice, then there's a Mr. Bao Qingtian in a way to get things fixed. Post-1949, the uh, party authorities set up mechanisms by which citizens could bring information, both grievances as well as complaints about issues that they felt needed to be addressed, to the attention of higher level party authorities. Legitimacy is one reason. Communist authorities always felt the need to sort of have some sort of mechanisms to stay in touch with the sentiment of the masses. That's to say, make sure that we as the party always has a mechanism to sort of understand issues of pressing concern to citizens. The other element is sort of because of the unwillingness of party authorities to set up in other independent institutions such as an independent judicial system, that's also meant that there's been this need for letters and visits bureaus which would allow citizens to sort of be in direct lines of communication with the party to maintain that sort of linkage between the party and the masses. Post-1978, the letters and visits systems also played a really important role in rehabilitating the folks who had been persecuted during the uh, Cultural Revolution. So you had a situation where individuals who were seeking to have themselves or their families' political determinations of themselves as rightists reversed by party authorities would petition to higher level authorities to say, you know, in the 1960s, I had been labeled incorrectly as a counter-revolutionary, as a rightist, and I would like you to reverse that verdict. And particularly in the 1980s, there was a big boom in the work of these, uh, these organs in terms of writing or sort of redoing those political determinations. One of the interesting things in the, late, the most recent 20 years is to see the extent to which in some ways the petitioning system has evolved as a dysfunctional alternative to formal legal channels. You have citizens rather than going to the courts or even rather than going to sort of the legislatures are choosing these sort of other channels which A don't work very well and that B are linked to sort of a range of abuses and C kind of generate a lot of discontent on the part of citizens.